Hello, everybody. This is the awkward moment where I say good morning, you guys say it quietly, then I say good morning, you say it loud. We're just going to skip that and get after it this morning. We got stuff to do. It's a drill weekend. There's plenty on our plates, but there's something important we need to talk about today. So let me start out with a couple of quick caveats here. Uh, first off, any discussions that happen here today or any discussions that happen in the small group sessions uh, later on that we will be holding in the squadrons, those are non-attributional. You need to be comfortable and understand that you are free to talk in those sessions in here and express your opinion freely and, and there will be no ramifications associated with that. Uh, also, we're going to talk about some tough stuff today. It's not necessarily the most fun subject, so if you are uncomfortable with that, if you feel like you need to get up and, and leave the room, first off, let me tell you, I believe that's a sign of strength. Knowing your own limitations, knowing when you're struggling with stuff, and knowing that you might need help, go ahead and get up. Head to one of the doors. We've got the Chaplain Corps available for us here. Uh, they will be there. We've got a team all the way around at every single door uh, here to help you. And please, feel free at any time to do that. It's a sign of strength, and I'll be proud of you if you do that. Um, why are we here? You know, we know the Air Force directed it. We're here because there was a 32% increase in suicides in the Department of Defense in the first six months of this year. That's a pretty big jump over a five-year average, and that's pretty troublesome. You know, America needs every single one of its warriors, all of you sitting here every day, and every one we lose is a loss to our team, it's a loss to our family, it's something that's not acceptable, and we have to figure out how to get after it. I will tell you right now, nobody knows exactly why. There are a lot of theories. But the one good thing we have is we know what we can do to help what we can do to try and prevent it, what we can do to take care of each other. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because I will tell you this, there is no CBIT, there is no video, there is no academics that have ever been presented that all of a sudden turn around and somebody goes, that's what saved my life, was watching that video. It's each and every one of you sitting here in this crowd right now that is going to save your life or somebody else's life. And that's why we're here to talk about this today. So let me start off with telling you a little bit of how I learned that uh, Mental health and physical health are really not that different. Um, the, uh, the reality is, is you know, I got a shoulder that's all sorts of jacked up from uh, years of playing baseball and CrossFit and other stuff, and I have to do rehab on that on occasion. I have to do work on that thing to get it moving. Well, one point in time in my life, I figured out that, you know what, my brain is the exact same way, and that you sometimes need help. So this is how I learned, and this picture means a lot to me. In September of 2014, I was a brand new squadron commander in Virginia, and uh, my wing commander called me and said, hey Zeus, we just had a crash, crash in Western Virginia, and we're gonna need somebody to go out to that crash site and help with security of that crash site over the weekend. It needs to be a pilot. And that weekend happened to be, or that happened to be just before the Labor Day weekend. I looked at my boss and, and said, hey, sir, there's, there's no way I'm gonna ask one of my guys right before uh, Labor Day weekend to take off. I got better camping gear than all of them anyway, so uh, I got this one and I'll go, send me. He let me go, I took off and started driving. And initially I thought I was heading up there to go be a, uh, a, a, you know, a security assistance for this crash site. Uh, on my way up there, I started getting phone calls from the Virginia State Troopers saying, hey, we're trying to run a search and rescue. We don't understand what's happening here. We're not sure what's going on. We need your help. And uh, the great thing is, is that I learned that day how fast my little Toyota Tacoma truck could go. Because when the Virginia State Patrol says, how fast can you get there? The obvious answer is, how fast will you let me go? It was awesome. <laughs> uh, but the reality of that was, is on my way up there, I got a phone call from another friend of mine who said, hey dude, it was Moose. And Moose was a dude I had known, grown up with, flown with my entire life, uh, that now we didn't know where he was. We knew his plane had crashed in Western Virginia and things weren't looking good. So first thing I did when I got up there was, and I didn't realize this, I'm telling you this story because I did not realize that I actually was jacking up my brain just like I've jacked up my shoulder in my life. First thing I did when I got up there is I go, hey, we need to go to the crash site and see if he ejected or not. I need to know this. We will know right away whether we're actually doing a search and rescue or not if we can figure that out. Got to the crash site, still burning, tiny bits everywhere, and spent the better part of a couple hours holding our breath, running into the crash site, trying to see if we could find something that would indicate whether he was there or not, and then running back out, taking a breath and doing that. We couldn't figure it out. So we went with the assumption at that point in time that Moose was alive, he was incapacitated, and he was hanging in a tree somewhere. And I had sold myself that story. That's what we were gonna do, that's what I was gonna hang on to, and that's how we were gonna go find Moose. Um, so for the next basically 40 hours after that, 
uh, we ran a nonstop search and rescue event. We had, at any given time, helicopters from multiple federal agencies, planes from different states. Uh, we had Civil Air Patrol. We had local people just bringing us food from there because we we're in the middle of nowhere. People showing up with sandwiches saying, hey, you guys look like you haven't eaten in a while. And that was, that was pretty darn amazing. Um, but somewhere into the second day of this thing, when we were at about the 36 hour point, uh, 34 to 36 hour point, we figured out uh, in continual search of the site that Moose did not get out of the airplane. However, we had a massive group of press people right outside our building who were watching everything that was going on, and at that point in time, we were still unsuccessful at getting a hold of his family. We knew where they were, but we could not get a hold of them. So we pretended to continue to search for another six hours after we knew, just so that that family would not learn through the news that Moose was no longer with us. You know, it was a great event. I will tell you that I as terrible as that was and as horrible as it was, uh, it was impressive to see all the people. And I'll talk a little bit more about that and see what they were capable of doing. But I thought, you know what, I did everything. I didn't crack. I kept my sense of humor. I ran the entire search and rescue. I'm doing okay. And I went home. And I fell asleep and slept like a baby the first night. The next night, I woke up in the middle of the night and walked to the window. And my wife said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm looking for the helicopter. And she's like, what are you talking about? said, don't you hear the helicopter? No, I can't see a helicopter. There's nothing out there. Go to sleep, I wake up again, I hear helicopters. I'm staring out my window. That goes on for three days. And I go, something is wrong with me. I'm not okay. I thought I was perfectly fine. In my own mind, as we all know with a fighter pilot, I am 10 foot tall and bulletproof, right? There is nothing, you know, flown combat sorties, I've done all these things all my life. I'm hearing helicopters. Scared the hell out of me. I thought, I can't talk to anybody about this. I'll lose my job. I won't be able to fly fighters anymore. I'll lose my passion. I'm, uh, how am I going to feed my family? After the third day of this, I went, I got a problem. I need some help. So I went to the uh, director of psychological help for, for our wing, and I sat down, and I just went, I got to tell you this. Uh, <laughs> uh, Shireen, I, I got to tell you right now, I'm here in helicopters, and I can't sleep. And she goes, well, talk to me. And I told the whole story to her. And she simply said this, and it was actually the most powerful thing I've ever heard. She's like, you're perfectly fine. You hurt your brain. You worked through that without flinching, and you never gave it a chance to process this. You never dealt with what was going on, and your brain's trying to figure out a way to sort through it. Don't worry about it. Keep working at it. Come back and talk to me anytime you want. How are you doing at home? How's your family? What support structure do you have? She asked me a bunch of questions, but that was the exact moment that I realized that you can actually injure your brain. And I did it. The funny thing is, gave it a little time, talked to a few people on that one, and I never lost my job. I'm still flying fighters. I'm flying fighters in the greatest wing in the United States Air Force. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about it. And what I think is important, what are the three takeaways from this? One, the one you've already heard me say, your brain can get hurt just like anything else. And just like you would if you broke your arm, when you hurt your brain, go seek help. There's nothing to be ashamed of in asking somebody for help when it doesn't make sense or when you're not sure what's going on. We all need help. It could be a single event. It could be a single crash, right? It could also be a thousand paper cuts that get you there. A thousand little things in your life finally build up, and next thing you know, you've got your version of here in helicopters. Or it could be the constant pressure of various things in your life, but regardless, regardless, everybody needs help at some point in time or another, and it's okay to ask. The other takeaway I had from this, and this is truly, truly the, the thing that I carry away from this, was just the power of humanity. And this is important to everybody in this room. I watched the FBI's hostage rescue team come in and actually just start rucking up and down mountains looking for somebody. States from across the country, Oregon Air National Guard and the Kentucky Air National Guard had a race to see who could get a combat controller to me faster. Because of the terrain we were in, the radios we lacked, I needed somebody for a cast stack. There were amazing people that were willing to help. And I tell you, as I look around this room right now, there are amazing people in this room that are willing to help. That same humanity that was there in Western Virginia that day with me, they're here. They're sitting next to you. Look left, look right. Those are the people that can help. 
We're all capable of helping each other. We all have a responsibility to help each other. So what's my ask? Why am I talking to you? Number one, I need you guys to be the front line in this battle. I need you to look out for each other and I need you to know when you have your own struggles as best as you can and not be afraid to get help. Have the courage and the humility to ask for help. And I know that's not easy to do. I went through that struggle myself, but I will tell you right here, I know the leadership in this wing. I know what every single one of us are dedicated to doing. And the number one thing we ask when we find out somebody in this wing needed help is, are they getting the help they need? What more can we do for them? How do we do more for them? What else can we do to support them? After we do that, the next question is, how do we get them back into the fight, right? 1,638 warriors in this organization, and we need every single one of you in the fight every time. We're going to get you back in the fight. We're going to get you the help you need, and I can guarantee you every single one of your leaders from top to bottom knows that's the priority. Get them help, take care of them, take care of their families, get them back in the fight. The other thing I'd ask of you is through these small group sessions that we're going to get to 100% of people talking to, hopefully in very small groups, is tell us what we can do better to make it easier for you to seek help if you need it, to make it easier for you to help somebody else if they need it. What can we do as an organization to support the warriors who carry our nation on a day-to-day -day basis? Bottom line is, is we're a long-term warrior family. Every single one of you is important to your family, to your friends, to your community, to our wing, to this team, to the state of Colorado, and to our nation. We can't, we can't let this one slip through the cracks. We gotta look out for each other. So that's how I learned. Um, and I don't wanna take up too much of the time. I've already gone two minutes longer than I wanted. Um, but I, I've got a, a guest speaker here. That did not go the direction I wanted. There we go. I got a guest speaker here. Um, Dennis Flynn, his wife Shay, uh, joined us here today and fantastic having him here. Uh, he's a retired Las Vegas Police Department negotiator, a crisis negotiator for the city of Las Vegas. 18 years doing that. More than a thousand touch points negotiating with people and I will tell you a lot of those negotiations are people with suicidal ideations. He's got a pretty amazing professional and personal story to tell today. He's got a lot of tricks in his bag of tricks to help us out and a lot of insight that I think will, will help you and me, all of us together, have a better set of tools to use to combat this problem. Um, the good news is, is he's here with us now. He retired from Las Vegas, moved out here, and he's now a uh, commander over in Commerce City for their police department. But let's, uh, let's take a second to welcome Dennis and uh, hear his words. that well I'd stand behind the podium but as you can see I'm one of the bigger guys here so uh, as the colonel said first colonel thank you for inviting me out here and, and for all of you taking time out of your day um, the subject as, as you can imagine that we're going to talk about uh, is something that impacts uh, all of us uh, police uh, police work uh, sold, uh, all the soldiers, the airmen, um, but people in all different walks of life. And as we get going through the presentation today, uh, hopefully you'll understand uh, why I'm passionate about it, and uh, hopefully I can make some correlations between what we did in policing, and I still do in policing, and what it is that you experience. But as the colonel said, uh, sometimes we might bring up something, and so please, if there's something that, that triggers uh, an emotional response, uh, the, uh, the, the leadership here has made sure that there's professionals that will be able to talk to you. So I knew if I was coming into your house, I had to at least post this. So. All righty. I wanted to start and end with a quote. Uh, 150 years ago, Nitsky talked about uh, the monsters that we fight and being careful that if you fight monsters long enough that we can actually turn into them. And it's very, very deep when you think about the quote, uh, but it certainly is applicable to what we're going to talk about today. 
If you battle these things long enough, it can consume you, it will consume you. You have to have outlets, you have to be able to get some of this stuff off of your proverbial plate. This is what I like to say was my office. I spent 30 years and three days uh, working for Las Vegas. I had the three days because I had some suspensions, so I want to say I did the whole time. Uh, I was the swing ship strip commander, and you know, it looks kind of cool to be able to see it at night, and I took some of these photos while I was uh, um, working the strip, and this is all the cool stuff that most people remember. Unfortunately, this is what <laughs> typically happens when you go to Las Vegas. So for those that say that uh, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas, um, STDs do not. So just please keep that in mind if you ever go there. And also don't buy the bottled water. They fill it up in the fountains a lot of times and they sell it to you for a buck. So don't drink the water. As the Colonel said, I spent 18 years as a crisis negotiator. Uh, that was a, a side duty for my main job. What that meant was you would uh, fulfill your normal assignment. My last assignment, I was the commander of the uh, robbery section on the FBI Safe Street Task Force. So as a side duty, uh, whenever we had something that would involve a barricaded, a suicide, or a hostage situation, they would call us and we would respond. And we would respond together as a team. And our guys like to say that they're hostage negotiators. Uh, the bad part is when I put up some of these slides, some people probably weren't born when this movie was come out, when they came out. Um, but we like to say hostage negotiator because it sounds sexy. And that's what we tell people when we go in the bars. But the truth is, what we do 95% uh, of the time, not only in Las Vegas, not in Nevada, but the United States and internationally, is dealing with people that are in crisis. And that's typically what you see there. Uh, these are uh, the people that typically, for them, they can handle that singular event. And what I'm trying to do is make that same connection uh, it is for you because you might be sitting there thinking, what is a police officer going to tell me about some of these things? And hopefully, as I talk about my profession, that you'll see that it applies equally to yours as well. And people, when they get to a certain point in life, those normal coping mechanisms, they fail. And they, they break down. And as Colonel Fessler said, your, your brain, your body can only handle so much. And it gets to that overload point, and it needs help. You're not broken. You just need help. So we're talking a little bit about suicide. And so the statistics when they put out, uh, as you can see, it says, uh, I cited our sources as 2015 from the CDC. That's because they've only just put out 2016's numbers. They're a little bit behind. But think of how prevalent this is. We lose a million people a year to suicide. More than 40,000 people in the United States every year take their own life. What's disgusting is it's the 10th leading cause of death. Now this is when we talk about uh, society as a whole. It's much bigger when we start talking about your and my profession. And for every committed suicide, there's 25 other people who have attempted it. So I just put that slide up there to just kind of give you an idea how prevalent this is. Yes, we talk about in the military, but it's certainly much even larger than that. Last statistic, men will commit the act four times more than females will. However, females will attempt it three times more than men will. And typically, because nothing's 100%, but typically, as we get older, the suicide rate will increase. That doesn't mean that we don't have people who are younger, as I'll show you, who also are involved. But when we start talking about uh, demographics, these aren't mine. These all belong to the CDC. Um, police officers, military, uh, white males, more than uh, African American or Hispanic. These are just things to just kind of keep as, in mind as we talk. And so I put this up here. I was, I was sitting there um, putting this together this weekend. And I put this up there because it shows you that you have people in their 20s, their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. You probably recognize most of the people on this screen. The one on the bottom left you might not recognize. It's David Strickland. The reason I put that one up there, I responded to that scene. I was the investigator for that scene. And here was a guy who was on top of the world. For those of you that maybe have a little bit more gray, 
you would know who Brooke Shields is. Some of you might not have been born when she was uh, uh, hitting her prime. But here was a guy who had Brooke Shields. He just started uh, with this, uh, the TV show Suddenly Susie was making a lot of money. That has nothing to do with it. It's life circumstances. I mean, everybody's familiar with, with Robin Williams. I mean, here was a man who had everything. But in the end, it was the demons that, that he battled and not seeking some of that help. So I put the police one up here, and I hope everybody can kind of track uh, when we talk about police suicide. Because you can easily substitute police for military. Because all we know right now is what we're seeing at the top. That's just a small tip of the iceberg. But what we do see is post-traumatic stress disorders, anxiety, depression. These are all things that are occurring underneath the surface that you have the opportunity to get that help. And this doesn't just apply to people who are in combat. This applies to all of us in our jobs, in our regular jobs, and please keep that in mind. We lose somewhere between 100 and 150 police officers every year to suicide. That's a tremendous number. What's worse is when you look at the slide that I, that I put together this weekend, the yellow is line of duty deaths. So for 2017 and 2018, if you took all the line of duty deaths that police officers are involved in and add traffic accidents, combined, police officers take their lives more than both of those. And again, it says police up here, but substitute that for the military. The biggest problem is um, admitting that they have a problem. And quite frankly, knowing that we have a problem, and then second, being strong enough to say that we'll go out and get help for it. Because it is difficult. Because we do deal with the what ifs. What's gonna happen? Are they gonna take, for the cops, are they gonna take my gun? Am I gonna go on a rubber gun squad? What's gonna happen? Are they gonna take away my flight status? These are things that people naturally are going to worry about. But you have a leadership in place that's made these assurances to you. And it's important that if you take nothing else away, that you take that away of it's okay to not be okay. And to seek out those resources that are there for you. I had the time to change this uh, to all the where it says police to military, but I chose not to because I wanted you to see some of the same correlations. Because we walk in very, very similar shoes. They deal with depression, drug and alcohol problems, stressors that lead to the two H's, hopeless and helpless. Because to them, that's what people are feeling. All they want is the pain to go away. And this is the only thing. It's not that they have this burning desire to check out, to, to take their own life. They just want the pain to go away. And sadly, for every committed act in my profession, there's a thousand other people who are dealing with PTSD issues. So I put this one up. I spent, th as I said, I spent 30 years. These are 13 men that I can think of that all took their lives. These are people that, these are men that I worked with. I worked for Chris. He was my supervisor. I was Mike's supervisor and I was Byron's supervisor. So this is a very, very personal issue to me because we play that woulda, coulda, shoulda. Those signs that we said, you know, I just, I heard some of the things he said, but I didn't pay as much attention to it. And so when I put this up there, I put this up there to, to maybe jar that with you. People that you know of that you can just think, I wonder if there's something else that I can do. Because cops, just like the military, we're trained to go in and solve people's problems, right? We're not gonna show up and be another problem. We're gonna show up and we're gonna solve problems. So the last thing that we wanna do is make people think that we're not okay. And I can tell you in my life, 
I don't know about you, but I would assume we're very good at wearing a mask. We're chameleons. We don't want people to know what we're suffering. So rather than think of someone that you know, think of the, the example that I shared with Robin Williams of how many of the talking heads that came out on TV and they just said, we had no idea. This was such an upbeat man. He always looked great because we don't know what's going on inside. Just like none of us understand what you are dealing with personally. It could be the biggest event or it could be those thousand cuts and it was the smallest thing that occurred that pushed that person over their proverbial edge. So now the military. When I have a chance to talk about uh, suicide prevention, and when we talk about the military, one of the numbers that's always thrown around is anybody know uh, the, the, the figure that, that tends to, that they say how many veterans we lose every day? 22. That's, that's typically the number that you hear. The last one that they have, which was from 2016, doctor, they just released 2017, correct? So it's not that we didn't try to give you uh, update information, but it's come down a little bit, it's 20. But think about that. We lose 20 US veterans every single day. The other part to consider is that second bullet point. Military veterans account for, the suicides count for about 20% of all suicides that we track, the CDC. Yet, about 8% of the population belong in that status, that, that veteran status. That just shows you how disproportional this is and why this is so necessary to have you come in on a Sunday so we can talk about. But what do you say? This is an easy topic. It's not easy to get up in front of you and talk about suicide. But as I said, remember, everybody's struggles are different. It's what they are experiencing. And to you, it might not seem like a big deal, but to them, this is what broke the, the, the straw. Because they're just trying to ease that pain. All they are looking for is a solution to a problem. And typically what we did uh, in, the, in that time period, I had the, um, I'd say the, the good fortune to go out to 1,032 of these incidents. I wish I could tell you I resolved it as a team, that we resolved them all positively, but that's not true. But I can tell you that through the, through the stuff that we'll share here in a few minutes, it made a difference to some of these people because we just try to help them see that even though today might feel like just poop, tomorrow's better, it'll get better. And we have people that do care. And every single one of you has somebody that cares about them. Because if they take that ultimate act, they'll never get a chance to experience tomorrow. And I had people that gave me a hell of a hard time because I was on a bridge. I was on top of the Stratosphere Hotel. And I told the guy, if you don't believe me, you can come back and do this again later. He didn't take me up on that. Because we got him over that hump. And they're able to see, you know what? Tomorrow is a better day. And like I said, I wish we can say we fixed them all, but that's not true. So one last point about talking about this is, this is what people feel. The ones that if you thought of, uh, about somebody that you might have lost in your life, to them, to you, it might have seemed like everything was okay. But this is that person that's broken inside. And they're doing their damn best just to get up out of bed in the morning and put their feet on the ground. But that's why they have medical staff here, your, uh, I call site docs, your chaplains, your leadership, every single one of you, you have earned this, you deserve this, for somebody to say, can you tell me more about it, and not be judgmental. But keep this in mind, if that's called upon you, to that friend, to that 
spouse, to your neighbor, to the airman sitting next to you. Their world's upside down right now. Emotions are really, really high, and they're not typically thinking clearly. No matter what it is that you say, it's not going to make sense. Not to them, not now. Not until we have some time that passes. If you don't believe me, let's think of it from the, from a, the instead of depression, let's look at it from the anger. I know I can't be the only one that's gotten so mad at my spouse that you said some things that you said, I said that? She's over there shaking her head. Because when your emotions are that, that high, whatever you will say or can hear is very, very limited. But I did put the teeter-totter up there. Some of you guys probably don't even know what a teeter-totter is. It was a mean device that some of us old people that they'd get on the top and they'd jump off. And it was mean. It was just mean, especially us little people. So what do we do? Well, I'll tell you this. The vast majority of people, when we talk about people who have gotten into suicidal ideology, they're depressed. Everybody agree? They're depressed. When they are depressed, please recognize that. Remember, you've got to talk slower. Because if you're your normal upbeat self and you're speaking really fast, they can't process these things. So we intentionally got to slow our speech down. When you first start off, it's too hard to ask someone questions and expect them to, to tell me what happened, an open-ended question and have them share everything. It's too hard. You've got to just find that little nudge to get in there and start. Active listening. Every single one of you has probably dealt with uh, the boss, the coworker, the whatever, that when you went to talk to them and you wanted to share this awesome story and they get their phone and they're looking at it. Do they give two craps what you got to say? Right? But think of that other person that made you feel good. They typically sat frontally aligned. They gave you good eye contact. As they talked to you, they were nodding their head. It's just being polite. But it's what active listening is. Empathy. We'll talk about uh, empathy and sympathy in just a minute. But use their name. Why? Because it personalizes it. And it's a big difference if I said something about Mike. I've, Mike, you and I have known each other a long time. And Mike, I, I remember when we had done this together. Remember, Mike, when we went out to the lake? And your kids, Lisa and, and Becky, both of them were there. By doing those things, you can almost feel yourself getting pulled into something more personal. That's all steps of active listening. But what they need right now is somebody who's not going to be judgmental. Rhetorically, many people have heard when they said, oh, suicide, so selfish. What a selfish act. Most of us have heard those type of things. That's not what is going to make this better. And we can't build this thing up into some horribly bad thing of how are they going to get out of this? We have to de-escalate it. Because really, in the big scheme of things, no matter what it is they've done, we can find a way to talk this down. If we've done it with bad guys, we certainly can do it with our coworkers, people that we truly care about. But listen to them. This is their opportunity for them to tell their story. I, I put this up here just a, as a, uh, a quick reminder of, of something that we suggest when we teach this uh, to our newer negotiators. But it applies to you. It applies to you in your, uh, at home. It applies to you at work. It applies to you when you talk to somebody who's stressed out of their freaking mind. Remember more pies. Again, people want to feel like they've been heard and understood. Minimal encouragers as they're talking. 
because women are much better at this than men. Don't believe me? Think of how many times your wife or spouse had said something and you go, huh? Right? We're not the best listeners, especially when the ball game's on. Instead, you engage them. Minimal encouragers, as they're talking, that you're saying, mm hmm, yeah, really. It just shows that you're listening. Open ended questions. Then what happened? Why do we ask the open ended question? Because it gets them talking. Because remember, this is about them, not about us. Initially, it's going to be too hard. Initially, it's too hard because they're in the muck. And how do you get them out? How do we get them out of that shell? Mirroring, repeating the last couple things that they say. Emotional labeling, the beauty of doing emotionally labeling. Boy, you sound like you're really upset that this has really hurt you. If you got it wrong, they're going to tell you. Dude, didn't you hear anything I said? I'm not upset, I'm pissed off. And they'll tell you that. And it allows them to feel like they're being understood by you. Paraphrasing, I won't go through all of them. In summary, you know what it sounds like, if I understand you right, Virginia, it sounds like that you've been trying and you've, been, you've talked to your spouse, but he's just not listening to you. And even though you keep trying, um, that it feels like he doesn't care. Is that right? Now think about that. Think about a serious issue, serious conversation that you had with somebody at work, a friend, and they summarize what you got. Because typically if you got it right, this is what you get. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. What are we doing? We're strengthening our bond. Here's some things that we want to try to stay away from. We don't want to be confrontational. What are you doing? This is stupid. Don't you know all the things you got to live for? Is that helpful? No. We don't lie to people. That's one of the cardinal things that we do as negotiators. We don't lie. Because once if someone finds out that you're lying, do they really care about you? Because they're demonstrating they don't. A big one that we do, I understand. When you're talking to somebody like this, do your best to take that out of your conversation. I still do it. It slips up and it comes out. But do you really understand what they're going through? Even if you're dealing with the same situation, do you still truly understand their position? And I tend to say no. If you can't put your heart into this, then have someone else do it. Because remember, they're at their end of their rope and they're trying to hang on. And now they're going to confide some of their deepest stuff with you. And if you either blow them off, try to hurry up through this, or just act like you don't give a crap, it's going to cause a lot of damage. So please keep that in mind. And again, remember, this might be the smallest thing that set them off. But to them, it's the biggest thing in the whole wide world. Eventually, we could put all these things in perspective. But right then, that's the most important thing. So I put empathy and sympathy. I had an old guy tell me, pardon my French, but he said, uh, if you're looking for sympathy, it's in the dictionary between shit and syphilis. Okay? Sympathy is this. Oh, poor you. Oh, that's horrible. Oh, that sucks. Empathy means that you can basically see it through their eyes. Without using the phrase, I understand, you can see it through their eyes. We all have the ability to be empathetic, to care about our fellow human beings try to put yourself in their position and most of the time if you can then you certainly can understand why they're in the position that they're in 
And lastly, the nuggets. Because as people start to share these things with you, they're going to tell you some of the horrible things of what's gone wrong. But they'll also share with you some of the positives. And when we talked about Mike with his two daughters, mm, brought up his daughters, and he was doing the head nodding, I'm on to something. And I'll keep suggesting those things back because those were important to him or to her. That's why it's so important. Active listening, truly paying attention to somebody is hard. It takes practice. But I will promise you this, if you work on it, you'll be a better spouse, you'll be a better friend, because I'll bet you, every one of you can think of somebody that you said, you know what, when I talk to that person, they really care. Why? It's not like they had this big thing that says, I care, right? They just had that ability to make you feel valued. That's what we're asking you to do, is make your fellow airmen feel valued. So we talked about some of the downsides. But let's talk about more some of the positive stuff for you. Some of the things that you can do, taking care of you. Because the other things I said, we can kind of apply talking to the to our, our uh, significant others or, or whomever. But this is about you. Think of your energy as a bank account. If you always are making withdrawals, you are going to have nothing left. You have to make deposits. You have to take care of yourself. Because I will promise you, we all know the workhorses. And unfortunately, as leadership, sometimes when you have a workhorse, what do we tend to do? We give them more. Because they'll take it and they'll run with it. Yes, sir. And they'll haul ass. But sometimes it'll burn that candle out. And you got to slow it down. Don't be afraid to bring that up. You've got to take care of yourself. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be good to anybody else. Because here's some things that happen. Because stress leads to these things. Stress causes this type of stuff. Now, I've never been in the military, but I can tell you, these are things that I see with all the cops that I work with. Don't believe me? If you know a cop, I'll, I'll be willing to, to bet a big chunk of them after they eat, where do they end up going? Right to the bathroom. Why? Because their body's all jacked up and they can't process it. It's their body's way of saying, hey man, slow down. You got a problem. You need to talk to somebody. You, if you choose not to, you need to make some changes in your life. Because this is the negative crap that comes out and it affects you. We got one chance at this. We get one big go around, man. We want to enjoy it. Don't let your heart get all backed up with these things because this is what happens. Without raising your hands, I'll bet you there's people in here who got TMJ. You know, so bad that you couldn't even eat. Why? Because you were stressed. You were grinding your teeth so much that at night you ground them so much that it's hard to eat. They either eat too much or they eat too little. Don't point fingers, but we know some tend to cocktail a little more than others. If I'd have known when I, what I know now when I got hired, I'd have bought a bar for the cops. I'd be a millionaire. Because we overindulge. There is nothing wrong. I'm not a teetotaler. There is nothing wrong with going out and enjoying a cocktail. We have a tendency to misuse it. The very first guy that I lost on my negotiations. Things were going wonderful for me. I spent seven hours on the phone with them. And we end up losing them. And so what did the old guys do when I was on the team? They said, come on, kid. And they brought me to the bar and they got you drunk. Because it made it part of that team, right? No. You poured a depressant onto an already depressing situation. I want you guys to go out and enjoy your cocktails, but just do it right. Drugs, we'll talk about that here in a second. Especially opiates, it's a horribly bad thing. But I want to talk about this. This is a book that's it's, uh, written by a former police officer who's a doctor. 
And I would uh, say that this applies just as much to yours profession as it does to mine. I would highly recommend, it's very easy reading, I'm not the smartest guy, but if I can read it, you guys can too. But basically here's what it says. Most of society operates here in the middle, in that normal range. You have some good days, you have some bad days, and you typically end up in the middle. But here's what medicine says. For people that are in these jobs like yours and mine, we don't operate just in the middle. We ramp things up. We have that state of, of uh, hyper arousal. And we're way up here, right? Uh, we call it condition yellow. You know, we gotta make sure, always make sure nobody's behind me, right? I always got my gun on me. Sizing people up, making sure they're all bigger than me still. <laughs> I worked most of my career undercover in narcotics because um, I'd go up to buy drugs and people would say, hey, are you a cop? And I'd say, no, I wanted to be, but I was too little. <laughs> so they'd sell me everything. <laughs> So here's what happens, we're all amped up. Think of your occupation, what you're doing. We're up here. Here's where things get sideways on us. When you're done, you don't get the chance to come back to this white area. Now I slept a lot in high school, but I do remember this. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Some nod your heads, you paid attention better than I did. So if that's true, then follow this. When you jacked yourself up here, you're gonna have that same equal reaction down here. It's how your body works. You're not better than it, you're not gonna beat it. Don't believe me if you're one of these ultimate achievers. You're that guy who can't make decisions on the weekend. Where do you want to eat? I don't care. <laughs> you're the one that sits in the lazy chair and you don't want to move. Because you're down here. You're that person that used to. What do you do for fun? Well, I used to golf. I used to work out. We become all the eustas. You gotta keep this stuff in mind. You gotta keep this balance because we're going to screw ourselves up. These are just things that will occur with us. Cops are horrible. We got a horrible divorce rate. I can tell you my son with the, in the uh, Marine Corps, he victim of it too. He didn't make it two years before he got his divorce. So I'm starting to see a lot of these same correlations. He drank a lot. We have suicidal ideologies. These are things that will happen to us when our bodies break down. We drink, we gamble, we have anger issues, we step outside when we shouldn't, and we take on risky behaviors. Pay attention to these things. I came here on my time because this means a lot to me. I put this up here so that you guys could have reminders of that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing this with my friend, with my coworker, with my partner. Step in, talk. Almost a, one in four cops have an alcohol issue. We have it so bad that we have all kinds of different hotlines just to deal with this. Thankfully, from what I've heard, they offer services like that to you guys too. Because some of this stuff, let's be honest, we don't like to run it up the flagpole and tell everybody. But if you have these issues, that you, every night before you go to bed, that one cocktail becomes two or three just to fall asleep, these are signs and symptoms. I'm not diagnosing anything, I'm just telling you these are things to be careful of. Our audio, the uh, audio doesn't play, it was only a minute so you're not missing anything. <clears throat> Opiates. I've lost friends and co-workers through overdose, 
who've been fired, who committed crimes. Why? Because typically it starts innocently. They get hurt, they got a bad shoulder, they start uh, and they, they put them on some meds and they can work wonders. But remember, these medications, they don't just make the pain go away, it plays on your neurons and your receptors. And it also has other effects. Why am I sharing that with you? Because in my occupation, 30% of first responders have an abuse problem. I'm not gonna pretend to know how it is here in the military, but I know that's how it is for mine. And if I've seen a lot of the other things that tend to, to work together, I know that could be a potential issue. So keep that in mind. So you gotta take care of you. How? These are things that you can control. Yes, there's times that we're gonna ask that you have to be done with the shift and get your butt back. Yeah, there are times. But for most of the stuff, you gotta get your sleep. You gotta get to the gym. Do your cardio. You gotta eat right. You gotta take a deep breath because if you take anything out of this equation, that four-legged stool becomes unstable. We're the same way. We gotta take care of us. You guys have probably all seen these type of things. I would assume you've had it throughout your career. We don't, but I can tell you, we use tactical breathing for our uh, SWAT guys. We use our, I taught the tactical breathing for our kids who I asked them how long they've had on the police department, they gotta look at their watch because there's a hauling ass to a call and they're trying to process all these things, you're not performing at your best. You gotta get oxygen in. Has anybody not seen something like this? Everybody has, a couple of you haven't. Real simple, in for four, two, three, four, hold for four. Exhale for four, two, three, four. Do it three or four times. I promise you, if you use that when times are getting stressful, it'll make you a better performer. It also helps you with your, uh, with your overall stress. Things to think about. You gotta be aware. We're almost done. You gotta be aware of what's going on. Nobody's gonna take care of you except you. Make sure that you maintain a routine. Get your average, get your rest. That normally means eight hours. I lost a friend three months ago who was a, a, a addicted to Ambien. Works well those first couple times. Very, very easy to get hooked on that crap. That we have a process to slow down and a balance. If you don't know what cortisol is, cortisol is a, a, a chemical that gets released into your body and this is some of the stuff it causes. It'll cause you belly fat, it'll cause you IBS. It'll lower your immune system. It'll attack your heart. There's all good reasons why we're telling you, work on these things, lower your stress rate. And don't forget your spiritual and mental health connections. I'm not gonna preach, I'm just telling you, whatever works for you, keep those things in mind. I know some of you guys are probably muscle heads, if you go talk to a uh, cardiovascular doctor, they'll tell you, you have to get in 30 minutes of cardio at least three times a week. They don't care about the weight stuff. Yes, the weights are important. Yes, we gotta stay strong. Yes, you don't want you, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. But you gotta get your cardio in. Take care of your heart. Eat right, we talked about sleep. Because ultimately, me, my family, we are grateful for what it is that you guys give. You make this the best country in the entire world. But if you don't take care of yourself, what a shame. And so I'd like to finish with just a, a short story. I told you I wasn't in the military, but I wanted to put uh, little struggles, uh, some struggles up there, excuse me. This is my family, my boys. That's Nathan, 
Patrick, Devin, and there's uh, Tyler. And you're probably looking at it thinking that Sesame Street tune, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> it's okay. You ought to see when I showed up at Parent Teacher Day. <clears throat> so, uh, Nathan, in Marine Corps. And um, as you can see, top left and bottom right, this was him as he's getting, going out for uh, his, uh, his first deployment. And he got, uh, um, we lived in Las Vegas, so they were deployed out of uh, 29 Palms. Um, truth was, had I not got hired by the police department, I wanted to join the military. I knew I wanted to serve my country one way or the other. So Nathan, uh, because he wasn't 21, he said, Dad, I want to join the military as well. And when I'm done with my military service, then I'd like to follow and do the same things that you've done. As you can imagine, like any parent, uh, especially if those of you that have children that are, uh, uh, that are in the military, you know that angst when they're getting deployed uh, into combat. But we saw him off at 29 Palms, and we're so proud. When he came back, though, he was a little bit different. Now, I can't tell you markedly why, he was different. Uh, here's an example. Um, little things seemed to bother him a lot. Um, but, it, but he was so proud, you know, of being a Marine. So with my kids, um, the reason I wear uniforms because my fashion sense is awful. This makes it real easy. I put this on every day and I don't have to worry about it. It's like little girl animals. They match. Um, but what am I going to do? Buy my kids clothes? I mean, they're going to return them. So I give them all money. And so Nathan comes home and he said, you want to see what I did with my Christmas money? I said, sure. He opens up his shirt and he's got this huge USMC. Uh, I'm not against hats, but um, that's how you want to spend your money. He's really proud of it. And then um, life goes on. You know, I go, I'm doing my thing back at work and he goes back, unfortunately, as many of you are aware of, uh, subject to recall. So that was his second deployment. The problem was when he came back from his second deployment, what was there the first time was magnified the second time. He would fly off the handle. Um, he came and he said that, uh, that he had gotten fired. I said, how did you get fired? He said, well, my boss is an asshole. And I said, mine is too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> figure these things out. But there was just so much that was going on. And here's the bad part. With Nellis Air Force Base being right there um, in Las Vegas, I had, uh, had a chance to work with a lot of the airmen who had severe issues uh, that would barricade or be suicidal. And being the team leader and having that many call outs, I got pretty full of myself. I said, yeah, I'm pretty good at this stuff. My kid's having this meltdown and I knew enough to have him go to the VA and if there is any VA reps in here or anything, uh, my apologies, my opinion. He had came back and said, how'd it go? He said, well, they gave me a handful of pills. And they said, come back and see him in nine months. So that just didn't work out for him. He wasn't very compliant. So what I started seeing was these activities. He bought a crotch rocket. Nathan doesn't even know how to ride a motorcycle, and he buys this. I said, uh, you know, as a, as a dad, what do you do? You just shake your head. Then my little guy said, hey, Dad, uh, it's kind of hard to see from where you're at. Uh, he was rock climbing. And I said, yeah, uh, if, you've been, if you've been to Las Vegas, you know, we have the Red Rock Canyons there. Beautiful. They go out rock climbing. I said, well, what's the problem? He said, Dad, he's got no safety gear. Remember that slide I showed you? These things are all occurring. The truth is, I'm not paying attention as much. He starts partying. He grows out his hair. He becomes a little bit of a nonconformist. And then this was the image that I remember him being in, that he would just drink. Now, we can play woulda, coulda, shoulda all day long. Um, but some of me, if, if you want to talk about honesty, I'd say, hey, dude, you need to figure this shit out, you know, and get back on the ball. But the drinking and everything else, it caught up. Three years ago, my son took his life. That was in August. 
and I retired two weeks later. So when asked about the opportunity to come share, I said absolutely. Because this was the last thing that I did with Nathan. Some people said, why do you wear your uniform? I said, because that's all he ever wanted. So now let's talk about the help for ourselves. Because my world was upside down. I wasn't ready to retire, but I didn't know what else to do. Now we can look at these tragic events and think all the things that you wish you would have done. And I'll tell you this, it doesn't help. I had a very, very good friend of mine, a psych doc, who said, these are open wounds. Don't be so quick to close it, let it air out. And so we have peer support, something similar like you guys have uh, with here. I'll tell you how stupid I was. My wife worked for, uh, for the police department, my other son worked for the police department, my brother works for the police department. So they reached out to me and they said, hey, oh, it's a female, her name's Mary Lou. She said, hey, I just wanted to check and see how you're doing. I said, I'm doing fine. I said, why don't you go talk to my wife, talk to my son, talk to my brother, I'm, I'm fine. Because remember, I got this big command. And this isn't gonna bother me. And she said, uh, you're, you're, you're retiring, what is your plan? And I said, I don't have a plan. I said, I've lost my son, I, I, there's nothing left here for me. And she said, I think you're making a mistake. And I did that, you don't know. <laughs> but I didn't know what the hell I was gonna do. And she called me the second time and said, hey, I need to meet with you. And again, I blew her off. I said, you know, I'm super busy, and we got these bank robberies going on, and all the same shit that I did before. I just delved into work, because it was easier to bury my head. And then the best thing that happened, Mary Lou called me, my phone rang, and she said, uh, how you doing? I said, I'm okay, yeah, I'm okay. She said, busy? I said, oh yeah, very busy, very, very busy. She said, good, because I'm sitting in your office. <laughs> Shit! <sighs> I go into the office, and it's the weirdest things that stick with you. We had those cheap little blinds, because, you know, paramilitary organization, we don't spend a lot of money on nice stuff. It's those cheap blinds, you know, you turn the little thing and they, they open and close. And so I said, you know what, I'm gonna appease this lady. You know, I'll tell her a few things. But, you know, all my troops are out there, so I, I close the blinds. And that five minutes turned into three and a half hours. And I bawled like a little baby. And it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. I still retired. And about two or three months afterwards, I took her to lunch to say thank you because uh, she got a flag for me. She said, how's things going? I said, ah, you know, they're good. You know, retirement, they pay us pretty well. She goes, what are you doing with yourself? I said, uh. She goes, tell me about your day. And I get up and read the newspaper, have breakfast, go to the gym. That's an hour, hour and a half, if you laugh at all the old naked guys that walk around. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't have any real purpose. And so I started thinking, what could I do? So I wrote this down. And before you think, did this guy really come into our house and write a book and actually try to sell it to us? Well, let me, hold on, there's a, there's a reason for this. I put Nathan's stories in there and I put the story of uh, a lot of the things because I think any jackass can come up and stand in front of you and tell you all the good stuff that they did. And do you really care, right? Tell me about some mistakes that you made. So that's what I did. I wrote it and I talked about the mistakes that I made, but it still felt weird. What do I do? And then I came up with this idea. Every penny that we raise goes to stop soldier suicide. So if you're ever interested, grab this and know that you're supporting this organization. We've done all kinds of stuff. We raised, uh, on one event, we raised $5,200, you know, for a family. I know it's not a lot to an organization, but for us it was a big deal. And it's our way to kind of keep Nathan's spirit alive. And so I told you I would close with another quote. And this quote here comes from Winston Churchill, and so if you'll allow me just this moment. 
It says, to each there comes in their lifetime a special moment when they are figuratively tapped on the shoulder and offered the chance to do a very special thing, unique to them and fitted to their talents. So when I read that, I thought, how applicable. We've shared some ideas with you. We've shared some ways that you could try to help your fellow human being. And as powerful as that is, it's the next part that's even more. What a tragedy if that moment finds them unprepared or unqualified for that which could have been their finest hour. And I hope that you remember that, that you remember some of the things that we talked about and that you're able to take some of these things because my story with Nathan, it took me a long time to be able to talk about that because the very first time I sat in front of a bunch of people and bawled. And it's embarrassing. And then I realized, you know what? Odds are we're not going to see each other, maybe except at the service station or something, right? And if you guys want to judge that, okay. But you know what? I know some of the mistakes that I made, some things I wish I had done different, and I wanted to share it with you. And instead of just sharing that with you, also give you a couple little things of things to think about and to take care of yourself because it is hard. And please think about this. It's hard to do by yourself. Together we can do damn near anything. And so after I retired, I came out here to Colorado um, and they offered me a job in Commerce City. When I got out here, I, I didn't understand why nobody else applied for Commerce City. <laughs> Sure would have been nice to get that laughter before I applied. <laughs> but I figure I got another bite at the apple. But I do know this, my shelf life is over here. And it's now time for me to take these torches and to try to hand them to other people. And what a great group of folks. The chance that you guys have to impact each other's lives. That you work in a wing, that you have leadership that cares about you every single freaking one of you, because we all matter, okay? So before I close, I just ask that you please let this sink in. It's serious enough that the military said we're gonna hold and we're gonna talk about this crap. And even though it's awful to talk about, it's critically important. So use those resources, use your buddies, use, I don't care if you talk to your dog, Right? Get this crap off your chest. Because just as the colonel said, my, expl uh, my experience, it hurts. Absolutely hurts. But you can get through it. Tomorrow's a better day. Colonel, thank you so very much for allowing me to come out to each and every one of you. God bless every one of you. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for uh, coming here and sharing your story. I realize that's that's not easy. I can't. I, I truly cannot even. Uh, can't words can't express how appreciative I am and we are for you to be willing to stand here and tell us all the things you did. Give us the tricks. Give us the tools. Give us some things to think about and share your own personal story. Uh, we truly appreciate it. So we have this picture from the men and women of the uh, the 140th wing here. Uh, signed by a bunch of the folks that we'd like to uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Virginia, if you want to come on up here, I will rewind rapidly through this and get back to your slide here. I don't know how to do this any faster. What's that? It's all the way back at the beginning. We've got some uh, resources that Virginia's gonna talk to you about in a couple minutes and then we'll get you on your way. Get in there, get in there, get in there, get in there, get in there. Awkward moment, somebody tell a joke. There we go. 
Can everybody hear me? Or do I need to stand behind the mic? Use the mic. I like to think as well what I lack in stature, I make up for in volume. I mean, you guys have heard me coming down the hall, right? Um, before I talk about the many resources we have available for our military, I just want to express truly, I've been in the field, a mental health field, for 26 years, with almost half of that experience here in our military. And I want you to know how proud and how fortunate I am to be with the Air Force, because they are the forerunner for research and noting best practices and supporting research-based treatment that support our mental wellness. They truly are in the field. And you guys today, each and every one of you, are a part of that. You are a part of that now in the feedback that you're providing and the work that you're doing independently and in your units and with your leadership. So don't negate that. And what I will tell you as a civilian is that you guys have access to far more resources than the general population. And so this is a list that I've provided. Feel free to take a picture so that you're aware. But these are free and confidential resources that we have in our community. Obviously, we have, we're so fortunate to have our chaplains and our chaplain assistants available today. Are you guys here? Can you just step out for a minute so that everyone can see who you are? Their services are completely confidential. The other resource, thank you guys, the other resources that we have as well are our military family life counselors. And they are counselors that work on base, but they are also an off-base resource because they can respond within a 30-mile radius to anywhere in the community, community with the exception of their vehicle and a home. So they can meet you at a Starbucks, they can meet you at a library, they can meet you at the chaplain's office. They do not, comp they do not keep any documentation you also, obviously, a lot of you guys are aware of the services that I provide. And I don't think my limits of confidentiality are very different than what you would have in the civilian sector. And my services are also for not only you, but your family, your dependents as well. Some other resources that you're familiar with are Military One Source. We also have the STERM Clinic. The Cohen Clinic, what's beneficial about those two, in light of some of you might live quite remotely, or maybe your schedules are pretty hectic and it's hard to get away, they support telehealth. You can, you can initiate counseling from your home with never having set foot in their office. And we also have Given Hour. And Given Hour is different than military family life counselors and uh, military one source in that they're a long-term counseling option. In addition to that, they have licensed clinical professionals whose license has to be in good standing to participate. They could be licensed clinical social workers like myself, psychologists, uh, licensed personal counselors, uh, basically any discipline in the mental health field where their license is in good standing. They volunteer one hour, one time a week for up to a year. And in addition to what I love about Given Hour is they have a drop down bar because they can deal with specialties that some of the others can't. In other words, if there is a diagnosable condition, PTSD, traumatic brain injury, anxiety, depression, and I'll tell you, they're the only resource I know that is completely free for drug and alcohol. They have licensed what they call CAC uh, providers who can meet and uh, provide counseling to our military members for free. There's one last thing in parting that I want to say is that I want to thank each and every one of you. I want to thank you for the value, not only that you have for the mission, but that you have to each other individually. Do not negate how powerful each and every one of you are. I believe that you guys are saving lives. Our airmen are saving lives. 
And I tell you that recognizing that nationally our rates are increasing. And in the military, particularly the Guard, they're higher than the general population right now. But what I know about our base comparatively is that our numbers are low. That tells me we are doing something right. We are making it safe for you guys to come forward. I am meeting with you guys. The chaplains are meeting with you guys. We're meeting with you daily, monthly. We have many members who are stepping far forward with courage to seek help. We were never meant to just sit, share our successes. It's easy to do that, right, isn't it? I got a promotion, I got a new job, things are going great. It takes much more courage to come from a place of vulnerability and to, whether it be with a friend, a colleague, leadership, a provider, to share that. Joy shared is joy multiplied. When we share in our suffering, it's divided. So please, guys, there are plenty of resources we have today. Please be aware of those. And if you need help, make outreach to someone. With our closing here, I'm going to introduce Chaplain Franz. And so thank you guys. It's good to see you all again. Most of you know me as Chappie, and uh, I'm here filling in for Chaplain Joe Murphy and uh, uh, John Moreland, who couldn't be here this morning. Uh, Virginia asked if I would just say a couple of words and then uh, close our time together in prayer. And I think one of the things, if I could tell you anything, and Commander, thank you so much for coming. I mean, that was just an inspiring story. I know it's a difficult time for you, and by you sharing it with us, it has meant so much, and, and yourself as well, Colonel. I think sharing those personal stories can really mean so much to us. In my experience as a chaplain, one of the, one of the things that uh, makes it difficult for, for you all to come and speak to us is, is you stop and think to yourself, you say, you know, I just kind of feel like crap, and I don't know how to talk about it. I don't know how to get the ball going. You talked about that. You said, well, I don't know how to get the ball rolling. It's one of the most difficult parts of the conversation. What am I going to say? Uh, let me just say that's kind of on us, right? That's what, what's what we are passionate about doing. When I go in and introduce myself to chiefs and first sergeants and units and stuff, I often say, you know, come to me when you want to talk about hunting or fishing or riding your mountain bike or rock climbing or video games or going to see sci-fi movies. Movies. They got plenty of interests and plenty of things that we can talk about, and we'll get down to the nitty gritty, and we'll get down to the things that you want to talk about. So, so just give Chappie a call, give any of the chaplains a call, give Virginia a call, any other resources, and just say, hey, you know, I want to come in and talk about fly fishing, and we'll get it, and we'll know how to how to, where to take it from there. Fair enough. All right. Thanks again for your time. Let me. Uh, I, I invite you to uh, to uh, pray in your own faith tradition as I close this portion of our time together. Lord, thank you so much for this uh, special time that we could gather as a family uh, and talk about those things that are difficult in families, um, things that we deal with uh, together as a unit, brothers and sisters in arms. Help us to know how to come alongside and, and encourage one another, support one another, cry with one another, laugh with one another, and especially during those tough times when hope seem so elusive. Thank you, Lord, for the, the gift of service and for the many blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day, blessings that often go unnoticed but never unappreciated. And keep us ever mindful of the ultimate hope we have in you, the living God in whose name I pray. Amen. Thanks, everybody, for sticking with us today. Please help out in those small groups and let us know how we can do things better and enjoy the rest of drill. Get after it. Thank you.